The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We've got some college football week two to recap, and we're going to go through a bunch of the, those games and check them out, as well as the NFL. We had NFL start up this past weekend, so we're going to talk about week one of the NFL. We're also going to do a little bit of a preview of that Bills-Green Bay game that's going to be coming up that will basically be completely uh, a laughing stock for you guys because we are recording on Monday before the game starts, and you guys are going to see this on Tuesday after the game is over. So let us know how we did on our, our projections and what we're going to do on the preview. And we're going to have to go through a few other things in the two-minute drill. We're going to go through all of this and much more today on Rising to the Occasion. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so excited to have you with us along for the ride. We're going to be getting into a lot today. We've got a lot of sports to talk about. And man, this past weekend was a lot of fun being able to see all the, the big time matchups and seeing some ranked opponents in, in out of conference games and stuff like that. And then, of course, the NFL week one kicking off. I, I don't know. I want to hear from you guys how you felt about the week one and the NFL. For me, it was kind of disappointing. I didn't see what I thought I would have seen in some scenarios and other scenarios. I just felt like, man, there was a lot of garbage play going on, like the cow- Cowboys whooping up on the Giants last night. Uh, so, I mean, just all kinds of, uh, you know, big games and stuff like that. An NFL packed weekend. And then, of course, we're going to talk a little UFC towards the end as well. Um, but before we do, let's bring up our sponsors for this this uh, evening. I guess it's this morning for you guys watching. It's kind of a little tricky for us trying to trying to cooperate back and forth with with the time change here for you guys. But it's by a new sponsor that we've got, and we're very excited to bring it to you because it's a way for you to go and check out sports books. All right, so we talk about sports betting a lot on this show, and we enjoy going into sports betting. Sports betting has been growing in popularity, and it's fun because it kind of puts you in a position where you're you're kind of a part of the game now. It kind of gives you a little more of a, a an interaction than just being a fan. And line shopping for the best odds really matters. That's why you know some. That's why with any profitable profitable sports better, you need to be using multiple sports books. And thankfully, there's never been a better time to get signed up. And we're here to connect you with the best promotions industry wide. Using our link risingto.com/bet, you can go there and check out all of the sports books in your region, along with a review of each platform. And it kind of gives you down and breaks you down that it's each of their unique features. So using our link, again, that's rising2.com slash bet. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O slash B-E-T. You can go there and get access to all of the sports books in your region. It's amazing. Most importantly, this page automatically connects you to the top promotions at each of those sports books. So whenever you sign up, you automatically get all of that added to you. So it allows you to start line shopping and seeing what the different sports books have to offer as well as give you an enhanced bankroll. So if you want to take advantage of these benefits and support our brand, please consider signing up for your next sports book at rising2.com slash bet. Again, that's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O dot com slash B-E-T. Again, you go there and what it does is it basically gives you all of the sports books in your region, and maybe you're you're traveling, maybe you're out of state, and you're going to be, uh, you know, in a different state. Let's say you're going up to Ohio for the weekend, and you want to see if there's different sports books up there that are available. You can select which region you're in, and it will give you all of the sports books uh, that are in that region, the best sports books. And not only that, but like I said, it also gives you those exclusive offers. It's an amazing offer that we're giving you guys. So if you're into sports betting, or maybe you want to get into it, maybe you want to maybe further your sports betting and get into other books and see what other other sports books have to offer you're, you're going to have to check it out again that's rising2.com slash bet 
Uh, it's an amazing way to find all of your sports betting. Like I said, we still have our partnership with Pro Throw, and we still love them, and we still love doing it th- through that way. But when it comes to a sports book, maybe you want to add to parlays and stuff like that, uh, shopping around and seeing different lines and stuff like that, you can go over there and check it out. And like I said, it makes it so much easier for you to know what's available. And also, like I said, giving you a little extra cash to bet on. But let me bring in my two co-hosts for the evening because we're going to have to get to talking about some sports. We, we kind of ran into, the, into this issue you last week trying to get into recapping college football and man we just couldn't stop talking on it so i'm gonna go ahead and bring in first the man from mobile alabama himself blake lane blake how you doing brother i'm doing good josh uh my auburn tigers are two and oh brother and and i couldn't be more proud of those guys going out to the west coast playing in pac-12 after dark and scratching out a w man well there's uh, there's multiple game. there's multiple alabama teams that are two and oh though right no, there's actually not. Oh, uh, really? The, well, the Aub- so, so Auburn's the only what is one? That? Yeah, uh, Auburn is the only team in the state of Alabama that is still undefeated right now. So, uh, yeah, the Alabama Crimson Tide took the L, and, and I can't wait to talk about that one. But, uh, man, just uh, a hard-fought battle out in Berkeley uh, the other night against the Cal Bears. And, uh, you know, I, I've been saying this to the Auburn fans. Uh, you know, championship teams win ugly games like that. And when your offense isn't performing the way it should be, uh, you got to step up on the defensive side of the football. And I'm just, I'm damn proud of the defense. They were uh, criticized very heavily uh, in the off season and fall camp over summer workouts. And uh, they said that we couldn't stop the run. And then the starting running back for Cal, Jay Knott, he ran for what 200 300 yards uh week one against north texas and then um and he come out and said that auburn on tape uh he didn't see much and they were just a name uh, a name of the past so uh, i'm so proud of those guys man and and just standing up and uh and and getting a hard-fought victory and coming back home uh two and oh man that it really uh it really brightened the weekend for me it was good to see auburn uh, you know, under Hugh Freeze, just just scratch one out because I, I believe a year ago we would have lost that game. We would have found a, a way to lose that game. Uh, so it feels like a different atmosphere, a different era has started, and uh, and I'm excited about the future, man. And as far as the NFL goes, uh, I'm with you, Josh. Like I started watching a little bit of it yesterday. There was some sloppy play. Uh, I thought that Dolphins, uh, what was it, Dolphins Chargers game? I thought that was a good one. Uh, but other than that, man, it was just uh, – it was wild. But I do want to say one thing about the NFL. Baker freaking Mayfield, dude. Uh, Win in to, that locker room, man. Way to bow your neck in the fourth quarter. And when your team needs you, you go make plays down the stretch in a game that you're not supposed to win. Uh Good for that dude, man. Good for that dude. Uh, that defense is still nasty. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of him. It's good for him to, to bounce back uh, when everybody is kind of wanting him to fail, it seems. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of excitement, and I'm just ready for this game, man. This Jets, Aaron Rodgers era, I want to see how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right there with you. But, man, I, I, you mentioned the man all the way from Mobile himself, but I'm going to mention the man right across the room from me all the way on the other side of the room. we got Jeremy. Jeremy, there's more Pac-12 teams that are undefeated then teams in Alabama undefeated. Can you believe it? Dude, once I saw Alabama take the fat L, I was like a little kid on Christmas. <laughs> just because even I know obviously when you went live over the weekend, I didn't get a chance to hop on this whole week just because I, I was on a much-needed getaway vacation. And I, I did miss all you guys. Missed you, Josh. Missed you, Blake. Then there was so much college football that went on. There was a lot of crazy games. There was a lot of long games. There was a lot of games you just knew right from the get-go that was just going to be a blowout but we got a lot of talk to so i'm going to cut the chit chat and we can get kicking yeah absolutely let's get to it but man i, I had to throw that little that little alabama uh, jab for you there blake because I, I loved it i loved it i saw you i saw you kind of post that and seeing all the alabama fans try to make their excuses hey it's okay dude like you, you've been on top for so long chill out yeah, we're teasing you and, and you know what good for you guys good for you guys for for having this dynasty as long as you have take yeah, a break man. take a break let somebody else step in the spotlight just a little take a little bit of weight off the back 
Nah, I love it. I love I love the banter. I love the the rivalry. Here soon, Blake and I are going to be kind of throwing little jabs like that at each other. We were talking about this the other night, and I'm so happy to see your Tigers doing good because I feel like right now, from from what we've seen, Oklahoma and Auburn are really in in, a, in the same spot too. So I'm really excited next year. Go to Auburn. Uh, it'll be my first time there in Jordan Hare. I'm excited, man. Um, but man, let, let's get into it. Let's start off with Notre Dame. All right, because Notre Dame they beat North Carolina State forty-five to twenty-four. You know, a, a really, a really fun game. That was one that it just seemed like man, it, it came down to the wire. Uh, and and you know, I I just I, when I when I looked down to oh I I shouldn't I shouldn't say it came down to the wire. It came it came down to about ha- the wire of halftime. That sounds. Uh, cool. and, but I mean, just watching the way that that Notre Dame's been been playing, guys. I I just. I look at Notre Dame. We we had some higher expectations out of Notre Dame, and I, and I expected this to be a better year, a more of a turnaround year for Notre Dame as a whole. But to look at Notre Dame and what they've done, I mean, Sam Hartman stepping into this into this uh, new system, a new team, a whole new squad with them. The dude, he balled out again. Mm-hmm. So I mean, just just seeing what he's been able to do, everyone around him just seems to to really flock to his his leadership skills out there on offense. So this offense is looking good, but the defense steps up when they need to. They make the big plays when they need to, uh, and I think that's that's what you can look at with with this Notre Dame team, guys. I, I, I it was it was too early to call it when we saw how how good they played against Navy. It was too good or too early to call it when we saw how good they played uh, in, in in week one. And then now coming into week two, man, they, they've they've got a tough road ahead of them for sure. But this North Carolina team, they, they look dangerous. They've got two weeks until Ohio State. Uh, that's going to be on the twenty third. I'm I'm really looking forward to that game. Uh, I think that's going to be one where we we can finally stamp the the approval on this Fighting Irish team. So I mean, just looking over at at, at the Irish. I mean, at Jeremy, we'll start off with you, man. I mean, seeing seeing what they were able to do. Uh, as a whole, as a team, it was it was really, uh, really fascinating to see see what they were able to do on Saturday against a, a better opponent, going to an ACC opponent. So it's not just a walk in the park anymore. No, I mean I know everyone says look at the Irish, but the Irish definitely brought their A game to against NC State. I know looking at them, like Einstein ran for 134 yards. And then I know obviously after the really long rain delay, that's going to be a big thing for. Um, for just the entire team. I know right off the get-go, they ran an 80-yard touchdown right for it. I mean, it's one thing to have a delay like that and lose all your momentum and stamina, but you you start off the game like that with an 80-yard return, What have at it, dude. Like, I know, obviously, you and Freeman was talking about, like, this is a sign for, for them for a mature football team, and having that confidence in yourself is really, really huge. I know you can look at all the other stats, like, for the game in general, like I know, Enzyme was having a heck of a day. I know he had, I think it was 14 carries for, like 140 some odd yards. Then even Sam Hartman went 15 for 24 for 286 yards in general. That's a great game for you. Yeah, and four passing touchdowns exactly. on the day. I mean, yeah. just, I mean, you look at just the team stats too. Like I said, yeah. that the team as a whole, they just completely dominated, exactly. uh, pretty much in every facet of the ball or uh, every facet of the game. But Blake, one thing that we mentioned in week zero, talking about this new offensive coordinator stepping in uh, to take over to, for Tommy Reese, we talked about the Navy game from a season ago and how it wasn't that Notre Dame wasn't the better team; it's that they walked in and then they they got that lead and that Tommy Reese. The, the, uh, offense, the offense just really slowed down and they just let off the gas pedal and allowed Navy to make it a scary game where this year we're not seeing that. And in the fourth quarter alone, the Irish scored 21 points in the fourth quarter to really seal this game. Uh, just really exciting for, for this fighting Irish team right now, man. Yeah, and, and one thing about Notre Dame in this game uh, with NC State, they had to go through a, uh, a weather delay. Yeah. So uh, I believe lightning hit NC State scoreboard. Uh, that's how yeah, bad I saw it was. that. Yeah, so it, it, it uh, made the power out. It you know, like it caused a power outage and everything at the very least. When I mean, he just just insane. Yeah, so th- they had to deal with that, and then they were on the road. Uh, anytime you go on the road to an NC State, a, a Power Five ACC program that uh, you know they haven't been the greatest, but they're competitive throughout the years. They have been. Uh, and so it, it was a somewhat of a test, and they handled that. 
Uh, and, and, you know, Sam Hartman is a dude, man. He's going to put this team uh, in a position to win. They can run the football. They're playing defense this year. Uh, they're physical at the line of scrimmage this year. That's what I'm really impressed with uh, in Notre Dame through the first two weeks. Now, that game against Ohio State is going to tell us a lot more. Uh, but I feel like with Sam Hartman at quarterback, this is a completely different Notre Dame team. Um, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure about talking college football playoff just because their schedule is so tough. But man, uh, if he keeps lighting it up like this. It's going to be – I mean, if, if they get by Ohio State, they got USC left, and I believe they got Clemson, uh, which we saw what Clemson was all about. Um, you know, if you get by Ohio State, I think you got to start talking like, hey, man, this team, they're for real. You know, they're for real. And uh, I think the college football playoff could be in the picture uh, with Cam, um, not, uh, Sam, Sam Hartman. Hartman. Sam Hartman. Yeah. Um, with Sam Hartman at quarterback, he's just that good, man. Yeah, yeah, and looking at him right now too, I want to bring up his his season stats so far. So he's gotten three games under his belt uh, a week ahead of most teams, but he's he's throwing at seventy five percent and mm-hmm. over seven hundred yards. He's he's going to reach that thousand yards very early in the Easy. season, uh, throwing for you know o- almost eleven and a half yards per reception. Uh, you know, he's got ten touchdowns and no interceptions on the season too. So looking at, at what he's done, the efficiency that he has done. It's it's not that he's putting up the big numbers and just wowing everybody by throwing a thousand yards a game, but he's putting up efficient numbers and he's doing it week in and week out. Uh, so, I mean, just looking at what the, the Irish have done, I'm, I'm right there with you. I don't think we can quite, you know, talk about college football contenders yet, you know, the college football playoff contenders, but we can definitely look at them and say they've got a shot to be there definitely. in that discussion. And that's what I mean. I think in a, a, a couple of weeks, uh, I yep. think whenever they go against Ohio State, I think that's really going to tell us a lot about them, whether we can really stamp them with the the playoff contenders or not. Because I, th- I think that's that's the team that's going to give them the fits, uh, the earliest anyways. That's going to be the first one to be like, hey, wake up uh, and, and see if you're ready to, to actually dance on the dance floor or not. So, yeah, I mean, just l- looking at this Irish team, very happy with them. Uh, it's it's an Irish team, too, that I feel like I can I can enjoy watching a little more. Uh, you, can, you can look at this team and see everything that, that the, the, the team has, has put into this offseason and seeing what Marcus Freeman has done as a leader. Yeah. Uh, just an, an amazing, amazing first three games so far and an amazing week, week two matchup for them, too. Being able to beat NC State because, uh, like you said, Blake, not 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 like a it's a, a a tough, you know, top fifteen opponent or anything like that. But it's still it's still a tough opponent. You know, go in into their stadium and uh, again with all the all the elements too. Josh, you also got to remember looking at Armstrong for NC State. What's the thing that you always say about touchdowns to interceptions? That's the most important. That game, he threw twenty two for forty seven for two sixty. He may have had two touchdowns. But he had three interceptions. Yeah, yeah, terrible. Yeah, you've you've got to you've got to pull something together better than that. I mean, just uh, overall, it, it's the reason why I say that touchdown to interception ratio is so important is because that's showing your efficiency. How many how many touchdowns are you allowing, or you know, points are you allowing yeah. compared to how many you're putting in? And and uh, I mean, we're we're gonna talk about you know uh, another matchup that I think kind of goes along with that too. Uh, here in just a moment, but let's jump over to Utah Baylor real quick. We've got Utah uh, in them going to Baylor. We saw Baylor lose week one, but that's kind of why I thought Baylor would come out and be a little tougher of an opponent this week. So seeing seeing them come down, uh, you know, and, and playing against Baylor in their home stadium, going to play the Bears. Who, let, let's be honest, they're no matter how week of a season they're having and how weak of a start they're having this is a tough Baylor team to to go against and so you know going down to Baylor facing Baylor they end up pulling it out uh, and and again closing the game out that's what matters the most here in these games especially when they're they're a tight game like that and Utah they, though they were trailing for a while they came out scored 14 points to take the lead in the fourth quarter alone uh, and, and just they, they looked really good uh, and, and I, it was it was another another game where 
you know, it, it was a lot of rushing yards for, for, for Utah. Yes. It was a lot of ground game. Just keep it on the ground and keep on going with it. Um, but just overall, I, I was I was really happy to see what, what Utah was able to do because I think in week one, there was a lot of blaming Florida for losing more than crediting Utah for winning. And I think this kind of solidates that that, that win over Florida. Uh, you know, I think it uh, I think it shows how tough they really are. And I think this defense is for real. I think they're going to be for real one more time. And I, they're still they're still a contender. That's what's crazy about the Pac-12 right now. Last season for the Pac-12, but Blake, everyone's really a contender in the Pac-12 right now. Whew, what a conference, right? Uh, they've taken so much. They've taken so much heat over the years, and they have completely fallen apart. But man, uh, this thing's stout over there in Utah. What I saw Saturday was uh, Bryson Barnes just couldn't get going. You know, he hit the the seventy yard touchdown bomb first play of the game against Florida. Uh, and then he kind of struggled after that in that Florida game. Like, and then it, it carried over to Baylor Saturday. Uh, he just couldn't get going, man. He, he was off. Uh, it was just a, a lackluster performance on the offensive side of the ball for Utah. Uh, and then they put in uh, Nate Johnson in the fourth quarter. All right. And when he got in the game, things started clicking for Utah. The guy started using his legs. Uh, he could throw it a little bit better. He was sharper in the pocket, stepping into throws. Uh, and and I believe Kyle uh, Kyle Whittingham he almost he almost waited a little too late to make that switch. Yeah. Uh, but he made it at the right time. Uh, and and they actually ended up covering the spread, running to the one yard line, and Baylor pushed them in the end zone. <laughs> Uh, to cover my six and a half uh, that I needed. So uh, that that was big for me. Uh, but this Utah team, man, when they get Cam rising back, uh, I think they're going to be really tough. And I always highlight Cole Bishop on that uh, on that defense for Utah. Uh, that dude is a playmaker, man. He had a pick Saturday, so I want to highlight him. Uh, he's from Georgia down here in the south. Uh, and uh, – and, Look, they'll pop you, man. They're physical up uh, up on that defensive front, and uh, and I think that's why you saw Baylor not be able to move the football consistently. But this Utah team will be a threat out there in that Pac-12. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And especially whenever you're able to put that that defense out on the field and rely on them the way that they can, and the ground game working as well as it has. You know, it was, it's it's obvious that that they had to keep the ground ground game going, and Baylor knew that. Baylor knew that if Cam Rising wasn't in the game, they were going to have to run, and they still couldn't slow him down. Um, but Jeremy, yet yet another great performance for Utah. And like I said, I don't I don't want to overshadow how bad Florida Florida played, uh, just because you know you know I, I want to I want to give Utah their credit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can give Utah credit, but obviously, looking at Florida, you can only do so much with that. But obviously, that was a new week. Now, looking obviously with Utah and Baylor. I know, obviously, Blake, you've mentioned it. Josh, you mentioned it for rushing without Cam Rising. Like, Dominic Richardson, obviously, having 14 carries for 77 yards. That was their highest That was their highest rusher. Otherwise, like, Richard Reese had seven carries. Then Sawyer Robertson had five carries. Then Dawson uh, Pendergrass, is that how you say his last name? I think... I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a question mark and wing it. But, um, I know he only had one carry. Then Jonah Burton had two carries. I mean, combined yardage at 120 yards between five different running backs. Yeah. I mean, that's you need to have a lot more rushing for something in that kind of a particular situation. And I agree with you, Blake. I want to bring you back here. I I sincerely think they brought Nate Johnson in way too late. Looking at his comparison rate to Bryson Barnes. That was a big night and day difference. Bryson Barnes threw six for nineteen for seventy one yards. Nate Johnson threw six for seven at eighty two yards. What more do you really need to ask for? Like Bryson, I mean, don't get me wrong. Bryson Barnes, he can compete, but you get a guy that waits till the fourth quarter and only has seven attempts and completes six out of the seven. 
I'm sorry, but I think you can probably guess who my odds are going to favor a little bit. And plus, he had more yardage for him. Yeah, and I and I understand. I think the quarterback position is probably the the toughest to substitute out. It's, oh, absolutely. It's probably the toughest to look at and be like, yeah, I got to pull the dude. But at the same time, it's the most important to recognize when to pull him. Uh, and and you know, I I think if they would have if they would have pulled Bryson Barnes a little earlier than they did, I think they probably run away with that yeah. game a little more than they 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 ended up winning. Uh, but Overall, just like I said, another another great performance by Utah. Uh, huge shout out to the Utes over there and and putting together a really tough team. Like you said, Blake, I'm 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 scared to see what what they're able to do with Cam Rising in the game with a passing threat finally back at the helm too. But you know, talking about a, a coach that's unwilling to take out his starter no matter how bad he is, he's going to wait until he gets injured. Guys, we talked about how week one just kind of seemed like maybe maybe Colorado is a little better than we than we thought. Uh, looking at at week two here, I don't I I don't know if I'm if I'm if I'm still as high uh, as as whenever they beat TCU beating beating uh, uh, Nebraska. Nebraska. They end up winning thirty six to to fourteen, but the score doesn't really show a whole lot. If you watched the game and you you paid attention to the game and seeing what it was. You know, my dad and I, we were watching this together. He was on the show with me on Saturday. We, 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 we're, we're sitting there watching this game. We were talking about it uh, on the drive. Uh, and looking at Nebraska and looking at Matt Rule, the biggest question mark about Matt Rule isn't his leadership skills. It isn't his recruiting and, and all this. It was mainly just the one man that he brings in, and that's Jeff, Jeff Sims. Sims. He lets go a guy who can compete just fine and pass the ball at, at an you know with with a great efficiency. He's able to put the ball in the end zone. That's the biggest thing, and find key receivers. When you go over to Jeff Sims, that the dude just doesn't have it. No, whatever, whatever that it factor is, he just doesn't have it. There is four four turnovers on the on the day. If you look at the stats, they don't tell you the truth because he was responsible for all four of those turnovers. He had an interception. He had two fumbles, uh, and, and well, I guess there was three three fumbles total. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was responsible for all three of those fumbles. I don't care what anyone wants to say. Uh, when you have to overextend and cause your your running back to reach back for a ball, that is your fault. Uh, and and I'm I'm drawing a blank on what the other fumble was. Uh, but then I know that there was one that should have been turned over. Uh, it was it was a guy in motion. Oh yeah, he did. He dropped a snap. Thanks. Uh, you know it, that that was another one. So that was re- his responsibility. And there was another one that should have been turned over. Luckily, the, the tight end stopped, felt the ball hit his back, but he called for the snap too soon. Yeah. And it ends up hitting the guy in motion. So Jeff Sims, I I, I, I don't like calling college students out. I know I know that's usually a rule that a lot of shows stick to, but guess what? They're paid athletes now. I consider them professional athletes now because you're a professional and you're getting paid for something. So I, I'm going to call the dude out. I, I think he, he needs to... Uh, be sat, you know, and then looking at him, he does not deserve to be on that field. It shouldn't take for him to have an, an injury to finally pull him off that field because he was doing nothing but hurting that team. That offense, based on the turnovers alone, which again were all related to, to Jeff Sims, led up 16 points. You take away that 16 points, this is a six point game. Mm-hmm. And, and not only that, but you, you also. Uh, you know, there there was the one the fumble the fumble that was a, a called snap too soon and hit the man in motion, that pushed your your field goal kicker back a little further and he misses the field goal by inches. He hits the uprights. The so I mean, just I, th- there's only one thing that I see on this Nebraska team. Don't let the points uh, deceive you either. Uh, you know, Nebraska's defense played exceptionally well, especially against a very talented Colorado offense. There's one, there's one side of that the the ball that we have no questions on, and how talented they are at Colorado, and that's the offense. This defense did tremendous. They were just put on the field way too much and in terrible positions nonstop throughout the game. Yeah. And no matter how hard they fought, they just couldn't get it done. But uh, I'll, I'll kind of lay off my rant there. Like I said, I, I think there was only one problem. Uh, with that Nebraska team, and it's frustrating for me because I'm that's that's kind of my second team to lean on. Um, but just I mean, Blake, looking at at Jeff Sims, I think that's the the key issue, and just that quarterback position as a whole because he's causing too many turnovers. So far, he's he's responsible for seven turnovers in my book. <laughs> Run, Jeff Sims, man! I, like like look, under this center dude, maybe. Don't look, let him take a, a shotgun snap because he's gonna fumble that too. <laughs> He did, he did. Uh, but I, I feel like they're using him the wrong way, man. Like, they are. Uh, look, you got to get him out, man. Let him, you let him make plays with his feet and his legs. And uh, 
This is a guy that he ran for like a thousand yards uh, in his career at Georgia Tech, and uh, you know he threw for I think I think he threw for almost four thousand. Maybe he did throw for four thousand, but uh, you got to use him in a different way. He's not a pocket passer, and uh, I, I think Nebraska's using him in the wrong way now. Those turnovers Saturday, they were solely on him. I mean, uh, it was bad, and I know Joel Clad even at one point was like, "Hey, man, you got to take this kid out of the football game." Like, uh, I just I think he's hurting your team, you know. And and I, who else does Nebraska have? Like, I was I was kind of at that conclusion. They got, like, they got Brock Purdy's brother, who really isn't too great. Um, and then you know, but uh, you know, Harburg, whenever he stepped in. He didn't. He didn't have the stats to to show it, but yeah. he, when when you actually look at the stats, I don't think they tell the the right picture. You know, they don't they don't show the right picture because Harburg stepped in, and he he had receivers dropping passes, uh, and that was that was mainly probably at that point just we're worn out. You know, we're, we're you know, but that, that's no excuse. Uh, and so I mean, just looking at that, I don't know, really know where they go to. I think that was Matt Rule's fault for chasing a good quarterback out of town. And one thing, I don't want Nebraska fans to, like, you know, kind of lose hope because I know Colorado was in the same position as Nebraska, right? Year one versus year one, uh, two programs trying to get back to the top, right? Uh, and I don't want you to lose hope that you lost to Colorado and they've had years where they were, uh, you know, a really competitive program and on top of college football – uh, with some of their players that they had in the early 90s and things like that. So I don't want you to look at this loss and, and just start thinking the worst, right, of, uh, you know, Matt Rule, we're 0-2, we lost to Minnesota, now we, we get ran out the we get ran out the, the field uh, against Colorado and all of this stuff. Uh, this Nebraska team will get things right. Uh, they'll get things on track. There's going to be some things that you got to work out, man. Uh, I tell some of my Auburn friends this. It is a marathon, not a sprint, all right? It is a marathon. Relax, take a deep breath. This year might not be the year, but let's 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 just take a deep breath and Nebraska will get there, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But Jeremy, I mean, uh, enough kind of ranting on Nebraska, I guess, and, and talking about how bad they played. Colorado still put together a good game plan. They still, I, I think even even with uh, some of the, 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 the things that Nebraska did wrong, I still think Colorado would have found a way uh, to, to make make it right and still come out and win this game. I still had them winning. I still had them winning by 10 points, uh, just not the way that, that everything went down. Yeah. When an opportunity is there, you got to capitalize. But their offense still still performed pretty well. You look at Shadur Sanders and what he was able to do uh, and the receivers and, and, and the, the, the guys around him. Uh, it, was, it was a good performance still. Shadur Sanders is the GOAT right now with how he's playing for Colorado. <laughs> I know Blake's probably laughing a little bit at me, but I mean, Shadur Sanders... I, I watched a little bit of a take, and they were talking that, and I think it could be true. If Shadur Sanders keeps playing the way he is, there he's going to be in the Heisman talk. Like, you, th- you go out against Nebraska. I know, obviously, Nebraska's defense was playing their game for only so long until it finally just started to crumble. But Shadur Sanders had 393 yards and two touchdowns for 31 for 42 for his completion rate then Shadur Sanders has literally mind-boggled a lot of people in this aspect. Obviously, you see him use his legs. You see his arm plenty of times for that many yards per game. Then look at even what they've talked about for Colorado. They've talked about, I don't know how forever long ago it was for getting a single receiver to get over 100 yards per game. First week against TCU, they have four wideouts get over 100-plus yards a game. Mm. Like To me, that just goes to show you how much it can truly take for – whether it's little itty bitty things or making monumental upsets or not upsets, I should say monumental changes in the program to get these guys the way they are. Then even looking at Edwards for Colorado, only had nine carries for fifty five yards. But I mean, um, who's who's number ten for Colorado? I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, um I'm uh, not sure. Wait, can you think of his name by any chance? Um, uh. No, I'd, I'd have to look it up. I don't know I'd their roster that too. well. But um, I know he's easily one of the top guys that he always gets targeted. I think it might be 
is it Weaver? Yeah, Weaver. Yeah, there you go, Weaver. Then, um, uh, he's he's a really good receiver, yeah. and of was course, Travis Weaver? Travis Hunter was still playing yeah. playing lights out too. And, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a dude that can be on both sides of the ball. Yeah, he had ten receptions for 170 yards and a touchdown. For yeah, the day. I mean, you get these guys that can bring this kind of momentum in a game to the table. You're definitely going to be sitting pretty well. I know it's only week two, going into week three. I know I'm speaking a lot of stuff that's probably thinking, Jeremy, shut the heck up. What are you talking about? I know, obviously, this week, Colorado has Colorado State, the Battle of Colorado. Then looking outside of that, it's going to get pretty, pretty tough. I know Coach Prime has been, all we've seen is talk and talk and talk. He wanted to put a hot tub on a plane for his son, for crying out loud. Will you just do us all a favor and just shut up? (laughs) Like, well, and you know, and, and it, it, it's it's been tough for me because I, I wasn't buying into the end of the Coach Prime stuff at all. I'm not trying to get but, too far into it, but yeah, but to but drag me I'm a I, bit. he's he's I'm I'm gaining a lot of respect for him because he he's the way that he coaches the guys and truly cares for him behind the scenes. He doesn't let that show in the media. He yeah. wants to be he wants to be this this hard coach that you know he's he's all tough. But then behind the scenes, you see little glimmers of that. Uh, where where he really comes out and shows how much he loves these kids, but uh, yeah, I mean overall, I mean just st- still a really good job for for Colorado. I think Colorado's got uh, a good chance to to win more than what uh, you know. I, I think a lot of people are kind of capping them out around six. I think they've they've got a good chance to win more than that because I think their defense showed showed signs of improvement. I think their offense showed that you know I, I think they went against a really tough defense i'm going to be honest i think nebraska's defense is really good yeah uh, and so you know the fact that they were able to find something and get a second win in the second second half uh that's that's really what i look at so like i said i think i was ragging on nebraska too much saying nebraska kind of lost that game and i think that is the case but ultimately colorado still did went really well uh and coach prime is really setting up for a big narrative now he's one of the biggest stories if not the biggest story in college football if, if not in all sports. <laughs> Easily. Looking at their schedule for Colorado. Blake's, Blake's not too happy about it. Blake, what's wrong, buddy? <laughs> uh, Bo Hemothy Nix is going to beat them. <laughs> we'll see. That's uh, what I was uh, yeah, that's, bring up. Is, is that in two weeks? Yep. Because they got yep. Colorado State this week. Or Bo Nix and Oregon, then they got USC. So these next three weeks, we'll see. We saw we saw a little bit. I mean, should we should we jump over there to, to your Bo Nix boy and 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 Oregon against Texas Tech real quick? Jump over there yeah, and see yeah. what see what they did. I mean, ultimately, so like like I said, Texas Tech. Uh, a team that we would have expected. We talked about Texas Tech quite a bit. I think Jerry Maguire is a really good coach. We kind of expected them to maybe maybe make a run for the Big 12 this year. They had a disappointing loss against Wyoming. That's why I thought between that and then also show the quarterback for Texas Tech, I thought that he would show up in this game, uh, pun intended, and I thought that he would he would try to beat his old team. And yep. Th- that's exactly what you saw. You saw a very good quarterback play. I mean, overall, I think you saw some some good stuff coming on the field. The thing that really hurt Texas Tech in the long run was Oregon's Oregon's defense was just all over the field and taking it away from them. The turnovers were killing them. And so, uh, ultimately, hats off to your boy, Bo, because he came out there, went 32 for 34, 359 yards and two touchdowns. Just an amazing day for him. Uh, really using Franklin a lot out there as a wideout uh, and seeing what he's able to do. Uh, at Texas Tech, though, the the fact that they were such big underdogs in this game overall, I don't think many people were picking them to win this game. And we talked about this on Saturday, uh, you know, on the on the Saturday show, where I thought that Texas Tech would make this one close, and it was going to be a high scoring game. We kind of knew that, but. To look at how Texas Tech performed, I think they they showed big signs of improvement against a much tougher team, and they were able to stick in this thing until the fourth quarter. That's when Oregon turned on the Jets and were finally able to put up twenty points, and they were able to win this game. Uh, and they ended up winning thirty eight to thirty. Just hats off to Bo Nix and, and the the Oregon Ducks. Like Bo, Bo, Bo. Uh, <laughs> what a guy, man! What a guy. Uh, you know, I'm proud of the Oregon team. Had them, uh, I had a minus six on on a parlay, and I just needed Oregon to cover, and they get a pick six uh, at the end of the game. Run it all the way back to to cover the spread. They were up 31-30. Texas Tech was trying to get a field goal to win it, uh, and they throw a pick six for me to cover and hit my hundred and seventy dollar parlay. So I love that. 
uh, look, this Oregon team, man, they're playing defense, right? And, um, you know, Dan Lanning's going to bring a defense. Uh, he was uh, the guy at Georgia and took the head coaching job at Oregon, and uh, he's going to he's gonna get SEC caliber guys up there uh, on that defensive front. And um, you saw that Saturday night, right? Yeah. Uh, they were, were making Texas Tech take, you know, long drives and everything yeah. and drive the field. And, um, one thing I want to see from Oregon is I want them to get the running game going a little bit. Uh, they're struggling to run the football. Uh, they struggled the other night against Texas Tech to run the football. Uh, that kind of worries me a little bit moving forward. But Bo Nix, uh, look, he's sitting at plus 2,200 odds right now to win the Heisman Trophy, and I put $50 on him today. <laughs> and, you're, you're liking his odds, are you? Yeah, that payout at 1,100. Uh, this this cat is slinging it, man. And uh, he, is, he is raising his draft stock. So I'm proud of Bo. Uh, I'll be headed up there in a couple weeks to watch them in USC. So I know that's going to be a banger. That's going to be one for the ages. So yeah, yeah I mean, if, I'm if anybody I'm, else has has some some high hopes for maybe Bo Nix, maybe you got another guy for the Heisman. You can always go over to rising 2com slash bet and find out what sports book is going to give you the best odds, man. I mean, it's it's an easy way to do it. You just go over there and and check it out, see what those odds are. No, I mean, yeah, just just overall, I think their their defense played. The way that I think Dan Lanning was expecting them to, uh, they they kind of play this put everything in front of you and keep it in front of you type of ball, which can work to your advantage as long as 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 long as you keep on top of your game. But uh, you know it's it's more or less just not letting those big plays hurt you, and it, and it ended up working out just fine for them uh, here. It was just that a slow thir- third quarter that I think got them behind. Um, but overall, I mean, just just a really good game for for Oregon being able to come out of this in a tough environment. Night game down in Texas Tech in Lubbock, where they're throwing tortillas on the field <laughs> and you can't even eat them. So, dude, if you're gonna throw tortillas, at least have something to eat with the tortillas. For crying out loud, throw some steak, throw some chicken, throw something. I wouldn't want to just eat a plain tortilla. But I mean, yeah, absolutely. Going down to Texas Tech in Red Raiders country, that's not an easy task to do. Going to Texas in general already. Is it's already a challenge than going to beat the Heat. Then that's another big thing that a lot of the people from up from Oregon, thankfully, prepared themselves obviously for not cramping and just having little incidents like that. That's those are big little things that not a lot of people think about that can change the aspect of the game. But looking at it, Bo Nix doing both things, like you said, throwing for three hundred, almost three hundred and sixty yards. I mean, all I'm saying is I just hope you you hear down the road. Like you just mentioned, Blake, Bo, Bo, Bo. Hopefully they don't turn to no, no, no is all anybody can say. But I don't necessarily think that's going to even happen. Bo Nix is an absolutely great quarterback. And I know you're probably his stag to go see him play in person. I would be too. <laughs> then me and Josh, we're actually going to go down to Oklahoma the third week of October, my first time down to Norman. I'm so stoked. But going back to Oregon and Texas Tech, like like you mentioned, Blake, it's pretty – I don't like having your quarterback having more rushing yards than your actual running backs. That, to me, kind of scares me a little bit. Just because I know it's one thing to obviously see a quarterback obviously through the pass game that also use his legs, but I'd rather see Bo Nix stay in his pocket and do have Bo Nix do Bo Nix things. Mm-hmm. We've obviously seen his arm. He's got a talent of an arm, but... I'm just scared for one of these times that he does break out of the pocket and gets run. He's going to get hit awkwardly and wrong. Well, and, and and the thing with the running game too is a you know Bucky Irving is such a great running back. We talked yeah. about him on Saturday too. He's such a great running back. Yeah. Uh, him him not being able to get anything and I I kind of expected you know uh, you know I, I just don't think they really gave them a whole lot of touches either. No. So mm-hmm. I just it, it didn't really seem like they tried to get that rolling. I think you have to keep on working on it yeah, for, like for it to finally. For the whole game. Yeah, so I, you, you really have to get that, you know, give them more touches and keep on working on it for yeah. it to ever end up panning out to be anything. But let's jump over to the, the big game. I want to hurry up and wrap up with at least one more here uh, from college football this past weekend. Uh, we had Texas beating Alabama. They walk into Tuscaloosa. And for those who, who uh, may have let's go. may have tried to call me out and saying that I make, made the wrong pick, go let's back and go. listen to how I made my pick. Because I made it very clear, I thought, uh, and that my, I'm making my pick because I feel like it's going to be the opposite of what I'm going or what I pick. 
And so I figured, figured if I pick Alabama, it's going to be Texas. If I pick Texas, it's going to be Alabama. So why not go with that that reverse psychology? Pick Alabama. That way, Texas can have their win. Because I was rooting for Texas. I wanted to see Texas pull this one out. So it's their last year in the Big 12. They're about to go to the SEC. They have something to prove here in this game. They have revenge uh, to, to have been made. Uh, so just looking at this, I think there's one big thing that stands out for Texas that was very obvious. So I, I think their running game can still use some work. I think their run game kind of looked weak. Again, I, I, I brought that up about them uh, you know, last week and seeing how, how it didn't seem like the same Texas without that run game because they, they didn't they didn't have B. John Robinson back there to keep on running for him and, and looking good in the backfield. That's that's one thing I think they still need to improve. That offensive line had a tough a tough game against a, a big defensive line at, there at Alabama, um, but overall only putting up 105. You still reach that that 100 yard mark. That's a good a good mark to try to reach, but just barely reaching that. You you've got to get that run game going a little more. Mm-hmm. But Quinn Ewers is the difference maker, and seeing how how great and again efficiency, seeing that he didn't turn the ball over, he was able to to put the the ball in good places. I didn't really see a single pass of his that was bad. He had the one bad snap that actually ended up working out for them because it was it was ruled a fumble or a backwards pass, however that that works out. And with the the running back was actually able to pick it up and gain the first down rather than turn it over. Yeah. But other than that, Quinn Ewers almost almost I'll call it a perfect game. Because no interceptions, and like I said, his incompletions were either dropped passes uh, in, in tight coverage, or just good good decisions to dump the ball in in a you know in a, a bad situation. So racking up almost 350 yards and three touchdowns against an Alabama Crimson Tide defense, being able to shut uh, Nick Saban up. I mean, overall, Jeremy, just an amazing game by the, the Longhorns being able to come out with this one. Roll Tide, eat that. <laughs> I love that. I was so ecstatic, like I said, like a little kid on Christmas, just because, like you said, Alabama has always been the spotlight for ever. I'm tired of Alabama. Nothing against Nick Saban or anything, but I want to see someone else get the get the proper light that deserves it. And I think it can be Texas. But, I, like I said, this is only the first couple of weeks, so I, I need to shut my mouth a little bit and just let's see what the season can bring. But, like you said, Quinn Numer's Threw 24 for 38 for right around 350. Then, like you said, being throwing easily a perfect game. Then, looking on the other side of Alabama, the big thing that hurt them was their turnover rate. Having two turnovers, that was that was hard for them. Even looking at like Jalen Milrow throwing 14 for 27 with 255. I know he didn't have the game like he wanted to. I mean, his average was 9.4, so I can't. I can't diss him that much. That was pretty good for him. But still, Alabama, do I expect Alabama to be like this the entire season? No. Alabama's is definitely going to still run up and prove a lot of people that they're still in contention for all this playoff controversy that's going to be coming up later in the season. But even looking at their rushing, like Chase McLean only having 12 carries for 45 yards, then having Miller having 15 carries and then getting 44 yards, that kind of surprised me a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's something that you expect uh, a, a little better out of. But I mean, yeah. Blake overall, I mean, at Texas keeping that time of possession and being able to, to shut Jalen Miller Road down, he wasn't able to, to really make any any good decisions. It seemed like that pass rush was working good and forced him to make bad throws. Yeah, uh, and so ultimately, a really good job by the by the Longhorns here. Yeah, it wasn't much to shut down, right? So uh, <laughs> I just I don't think he's good. I nope. I don't. I I just think I think Alabama has more issues than just at quarterback. I think their offensive line isn't good. Uh, they look slow and unathletic. I think I know um, some Nebraska fans that would probably take him over their quarterback. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I just – I don't think he's an elite passer. And, uh, like, yeah, he throws, he throws a nice deep ball, man. Uh, that's great. But it's, it's, the, it's the change up, like Jake Crane says, right? Uh, it's the intermediate throws, the check downs and everything. It's just not – I don't think he's that guy for Alabama. Uh, and I'll tell you what, man, this Texas – this defensive front for Texas is nasty. They are nasty. Uh, if they don't win the Big 12, then something is wrong. 
Um, cause <laughs> this Quinn Ewers guy, what a guy, what a guy, uh, elite quarterback. I will say that I think he is elite. Uh, Xavier Worthy, burner. Uh, Adonai Mitchell, uh, a dude. All right, he's got the weapons. We see it. Uh, their running game does need to improve, like you said, Josh. Uh, but I think where I was most kind of caught was I expected a lot out of that Alabama secondary, and boy, they got toasted. Well, and, I mean, and that was something that I thought they needed improvements on coming from from you know week one and seeing what happened in week one i just thought there was a lot of there was a lot of open gaps and stuff like that and things let through that shouldn't have and like i mentioned on saturday i feel like if we see that obviously nick saban's going to see that he wants to fix that he's going to he's going to get it fixed by week two whenever you're going against the texas longhorns who are who is going to be a tough matchup you know it's not going to be a walk in the park you know what they did to you last year so yeah, I just yeah. that that was definitely a shock to me that they didn't they didn't button some of those things up. They didn't generate a pass rush on Quinn either. No, right? Quinn had all day in the pocket, man, to throw the football, and that is something that is kind of concerning to me with Dallas Turner uh, and and that Alabama front. You're so used to seeing Alabama generate pressure, and there was none of that, none of it. Uh, but yeah, Jalen Miller is trash. All right, uh, you know I'm right here, baby. All right, um, I just. You know, see you in November, all right, because Texas wasn't your only loss. Come step into Jordan here, and, and let's duke it out. So, Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, a few other a few other matchups to just have note of. Uh, of course, we, were, we don't really have a whole lot of time to get to each of these. I knew, we were, I knew this was probably going to happen if we all start talking college football. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to get back in the rhythm of things, you know, of recaps. But Ole Miss beating Tulane 37-20, to 20, a good, good game by both sides. And I want to give a shout-out to Tulane because you were without your starting quarterback and still able, able to put up a good fight. So uh, that, was, that was one. And then North Carolina, man. Where's your defense at? You can't be going to a second overtime. Hey, Last yeah. year, we, we saw this. We saw more overtimes than two. Uh, they barely beat App State 40-34. to 34, uh, And then we had Washington State coming away with the win over Wisconsin. Wisconsin, it's your first year with Luke Fickle. Give it some time. Uh, still saw a lot of good things out of that game that I'm, I'm excited for Wisconsin still. Patience but let's, let's jump over to the NFL. We start off with the Lions-Chiefs game. I don't know if you guys were able to catch much of this game, but – one thing stands out, and that well, I guess I'll say two things stand out. The de- the Lions defense has made a huge step forward, and I think they're going to be better. I don't think they're going to be good enough to win anything too big, but I think this Lions this Lions team is dangerous. I think that defense has made a step forward. But Kadarius Tony, man, you have got to help your guy out. You you are missing the number one guy on the field. And I'm going to say the number one guy over Patrick Mahomes because even if Patrick Mahomes is out of there, you can still do something when you got Travis Kelsey out on the field and he's a big target. He's going to be open, and we we've seen that time and time again. Whenever whenever you know Patrick has to step out uh, in you know the uh, division division round and you know against the Jaguars, Travis Kelsey is so important. And he's not on the field. You've got to step up as a wide receiver. You've got to know that if the ball is coming to you, you got to pull in the pull in the ball. But not only that, you just you let your your quarterback down because you were dropping passes, but you also let him down because he has a stat that goes on his record because of your screw up. But ultimately, I like I said, I think the Lions they showed a lot of improvement this year on both sides of the ball. Uh, may, maybe just on one side of the ball. I think on the defense is where they needed improvement, but they looked good again over uh, on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, and then Amon St. Saint, uh, Brown, phenomenal. Uh, I, I was really excited to see what he was able to put together, a lot of the hype coming around him. Uh, he was able to put together a really good game. So overall, uh, I mean, Jeremy Lyons ended up coming away with this with a one-point win. That was not what I expected. Like I think any Kansas City Chiefs or any fan in the NFL – was looking at this lineup card. Okay, that Detroit versus Kansas City. I think we can all probably figure out who's going to win. But um, I didn't get a chance to watch much of it just because, like I said, I was on vacation. The reception was not the greatest. But um, from what I've seen, they definitely need to find some people that can actually catch the ball. I know there was plenty of times to where you see simple passes that you see any other any other game. Okay, caught it, run, 20-yard game. Caught, run, 30-yard game, whatever. You need to – I don't know if you need to spin your gloves, make them more sticky, or if you just need to buy a new set of gloves or just get a new set of hands or all the above just because you need to find a way to hold on to this stinking ball is my problem. Just 
looking at also like you mentioned going to the back to Detroit, this is like a whole brand new team compared to what we saw a year ago. Their defense was stellar in that game. Obviously, I know they were probably getting sick and tired. Oh, we're gonna get steamrolled, blah blah blah. But looking at this Detroit Lions team, they're definitely gonna be a team to reckon with this year. Yeah. Like after that performance, I'd be, I'd be really questioning if I'm playing Detroit this week. I, I, I they're really the top dog right now for that kind of a performance. What they just brought to the table against Kansas City. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I mean, Blake, just seeing seeing what the, the Lions were able to do. I mean, uh, do you think they're going to be good enough to make it to the playoffs or even push past the playoffs when when we see a little bit what they were able to improve, especially like I said on the defense on the side of the ball? Yeah, Aiden Hutchinson is a dog, brother. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that guy, that guy is unreal, man. Uh, Who? Some of the moves he was putting on were ridiculous, man. Just constantly staying in Mahomes' face. Uh, hell of a game from him. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think they're the favorites to win the North right now. Uh, the NFC North, like, you know, they're Chicago. They're right off. There are a lot of people. Saying. Yeah, Chicago's offensive line still down. Um, you know, the, they don't look great. Uh, Green Bay and Jordan Love, they look promising yesterday, but uh, I'm not sure – uh, what they can do with that Lions defense. Yeah, I think they're the favorites to win the North. I think they're a playoff team. I think they are uh, – I think they're set up to make a run, man. This offense is going to put up points. Uh, and Jared Goff, if if he can continue not to turn the ball over uh, and and play well, then, yeah, they, they got a shot, man. They, they got a hell of a coach. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about the Lions. It, it was yeah. a heck of a performance. And, and look, Kadarius Tony. From Mobile, Alabama, um, you know, watched him play high school ball. Uh, he's a guy, man. He'll bounce back. Absolutely, uh, he just had a hundred percent. He just had a rough night. Um, he's he's getting a hard time too. But I mean, you, you got to be honest with yourself too. You kind of deserve that. You know, you, oh, yeah, you, yeah. You, you you let your team down. You let your quarterback down. I mean, oh, that was man. you, you got to do better. Yeah, you get paid millions of dollars to catch a football. Yeah, you got you got to do it. Uh, yeah, he had more drops in one night than uh, than Fitzgerald had in his entire career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Max. yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, you know, as soon as you said Fitzgerald, <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going going Northwestern jokes there. So oh, no, not <laughs> that's that's where my head was going. But no, you're yeah. right. Fitz, Fitzgerald, uh, he he's uh, Larry Fitzgerald was was a monster, a legend. Um, but. Now, overall, I will say Aiden Hutchinson was a dog. He he was wreaking havoc on every single play. I didn't see a single play where it wasn't like, man, that was rushed. Or, you know, there was every every play was it was rushed because of him or something that he did out there. But I will say to the referees, I think you need to be a little more fair when you're calling because I'm seeing some pass interference calls on guys that are doing for what he was doing. He was definitely hitting Patrick Mahomes late. I didn't. I didn't like seeing that when I know what they call as pass interference outside. If you're going to keep it that way, I was okay with it because I think if you're able to get there within a step and still hit the quarterback and drive him to the ground, there was a lot of times where he was hitting him maybe two steps, uh, two steps late, or even driving him completely down to the ground after he threw the ball. That I just didn't agree with with it based on how how the referees are supposed to be calling the game. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not one to, to I don't I don't like the, the penalty the way it's the way it's lined up anyways. Uh, and not only that, but backing up to college football real quick. Again, why do we have to keep on making new rules for targeting? Because oh we were watching that Kansas Illinois game. That was ridiculous. That was Probably 10 different times they had a review for targeting, calling targeting for a dude that hits his helmet directly on another dude's chest. So just terrible. Uh, just I guess referees as a whole kind of need to get get all of these things uh, buttoned up. But let's jump over to the Browns bank. I mean, I, I know we're, you're, you probably hate to talk about it here, Jeremy, but Joe Burrow, we, we're expecting him to come out and have this big year because he just signed that big contract. And what does he do? He comes out in this game and just looked like hot dog water. He, he didn't look good at all. A terrible completion percentage, went 14 for 31 in 82 yards. Nothing on uh, through the air to, to prove for it. You know, he wasn't able to connect with with Jamar Chase or no. T. Higgins. No. Wasn't able to connect with any of his guys out there. No. And just nothing seemed to go right for this this Bengals uh, offense as a whole. Just a terrible game against the Browns. Uh, and you know, and I, I know the Browns are a good team. I'm not trying to take that away from them. But if you're the Bengals, 
you you've you've got to you've got to do better than this against against that that team up north in the same state. You know you want to you want to be able to win this game. Uh, and ultimately, like I said, I think this kind of boils down to the quarterback play just was not there. There is a reason why I didn't wear my Cincinnati Bengals jersey today. I knew, I knew this was going to be the reason <laughs> why. Cincinnati looked like straight doo doo, in my opinion. I know a lot of people were saying it was also because of Joe Burrow's injury that's still lingering around. I don't necessarily think that could be an issue just because he's had plenty of time to get healed up. He's obviously gone to PT and get himself right, but. You can even tell, obviously, in press conferences talking to Jamar Chase, he was beyond pissed. And take it for granted, Cincinnati and Cleveland, we've never been good against Cleveland. I'm not saying that no. just to just to say anything, but we're Cleveland has beaten us five out of the last six times. We've never been good against in-state teams. And like you said, offensive line looked like crap. Yes, there was times that... We had moments, but, I mean, it's first week. I really, really, once I saw the score, I started to drink to it. Um, it was hard to watch, hard to hear about. But, like I said, it's first week. We got to get it behind us, and we got to we gotta take this and learn from it is the big thing. If you're just going to keep debbing down yourself and just thinking back, oh, we lost like this, like the clue, whatever, you're just going to keep digging yourself in a deep hole here. Yeah. And I sincerely want you guys to – I want you guys to take this and learn from it. Obviously, you're going to watch plenty of film. You're going to do a lot of studying here. But you need to let this go and just get this behind you. It's a new week. you got to get right, get going. From the from day one, from here on out, you got to go into the next week and just ball out. That's my thing. Yeah, and looking at it, too, I mean, it, it – you look at the other the other side of the ball for quarterback. Deshaun Watson didn't really have that great of a game, uh, but just ultimately, I, th- I don't know if it was just this Browns defense was really wreaking that much havoc, uh, or if if it really was. But Blake, do you think do you think Joe Burrow is going to have another season like this where he starts off slow? And we saw that we've seen this for the past two seasons, you know, two or three seasons since he's been in the league. Starts off <laughs> slow and finally comes around towards the end of the season and kicks it into high gear, makes the playoffs, and is able to make more noise there. Yeah, the Bengals would be fine, man. I, I look, their offensive line's atrocious right now. You gotta, you gotta clear that up. Uh, but give all the credit to that Browns defense, man. Uh, I'd be nasty. terrified if I saw Barrett coming towards me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah nasty, nasty performance. Um, well, and they've, they've yeah. always got the dudes. It just seems like the Browns aren't able able to put it together and actually do something with it. And I, maybe, maybe this is finally the year. But I feel like everyone says that every year for the Browns, and it just doesn't ever feel like it really is the time that it's going to click. Yep, I agree. I agree. Uh, Deshaun Watson's got to play better. Uh, you know, I to be honest with you, I hope he doesn't. But uh, you know, <laughs> me too. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, order, I'm totally fine with it. Show who the yeah, better Ohio yeah. team is. In order for them to be great, he's going to have to. So, uh, yeah, the, the Bengals will be fine, man. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. But jumping over to the Jacksonville Jaguars against the Indianapolis Colts, uh, Jacksonville goes up to Indianapolis to play Anthony Richardson in his first NFL start, uh, at least regular or season regular start, season. Uh, and seeing what he's able to do. And I, was, I wasn't very high on Anthony Richardson. I wasn't since last season. I didn't really see him getting drafted and him doing well. But he put up some stats mm-hmm. on the day uh he looked really good 24 for 37 223 put him put in a touchdown he did throw an interception but the dude was just an animal he was all over he was he was causing a lot of issues for a, a pretty good jacksonville uh defense and so that was really fun to see him but ultimately what i was really excited to see was how trevor lawrence was going to come out and start this season off with really being able to click last season he was able to come out and, and put together a really good game uh, he did throw an interception which is something that we talked about we want to see a little bit less from him this season but it's week one you're able you're able to put some of that stuff behind you especially when if you walk out with the win 31 21 uh trevor lawrence though 241 and two touchdowns just looked really good i was really happy with his play uh, and then uh, etn uh, you know another running back that we that we talked about too and what they were going to be able to do the the garbage play was just kind of ridiculous uh, i wanted to have the clip up but did, did you guys see where uh, it was it was ruled a fumble from uh trevor lawrence tank bigsby picks it up and then it gets swatted out of his hands, and they call it a fumble, and they they, they were able to run it back for a touchdown. Yeah. Personally, I, I think it was a fumble forward, but whenever I, I look at it, the way that it, Tank Tank picks it up, and he stays there, I, I don't know what that rule is now. If he's if he's standing still, is that not a dead ball there? To me, there was no whistles, so I think it was called right. 
but I don't I don't know if I totally agree with the way it was called, but still just just kind of a freak a freak play there. Yeah. But I mean, Jeremy uh, just it, it, kind of a surprising a surprising performance by Anthony Richardson. But over on the other side of the ball, the Jacksonville Jaguars looking like they're picking up right where they left off. Yeah, definitely. The Jacksonville Jaguars like there's been so much talk about Trevor Lawrence. Oh, he's going to be washed up after the season. Get out of here. Trevor Lawrence definitely has a lot of prime left in his life. I mean, like you said, throwing 24 for 32, having 240 yards, two tutties, unfortunately one interception, but you're never going to be perfect every single game. And I know you definitely got a lot to look at in this game. Obviously, with Jacksonville going up, only not really scoring until the fourth quarter, only putting up past seven points. But, I mean, it was really a back-and-forth game a little bit looking at, just from what I saw for the highlights, take it for granted, I didn't get to watch all of it. But it looked like a pretty decent match despite the score. But looking at it, obviously, T.E. Jr. having 18 carries for 77 yards, then uh, Ridley having eight receptions for 101 yards. But, I mean, looking at it, there was definitely a lot of a, what looked like it was one of those games where it looked like it, there was a lot more to it than what was actually put out, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, I mean, uh, Blake, I uh, know we, we talked a little bit about the Jags being one of our favorites for the season and everything. But, uh, like I said, I think they looked pretty good as a whole. I think Anthony Richardson kind of exposed some of their weaknesses uh, there. But, overall, I mean, if you take that that fumble return for you know for a scoop and score, they, they played a really good game, and they were able to win this game comfortably, you know, 10 points. Um, put together a, re- a really good showing in week one. This Jags team is for real, people. They are for real. Uh, ETN and Tank in the backfield. Uh, <laughs> Calvin Ridley making his debut. Uh, look, they got weapons, man. The Jones kid out there, they got weapons. Uh, they're going to they're gonna put up points on offense. Uh, their defense played really well, uh, especially down the stretch. And, and, you know, one thing I want to say about AR, man, is I was kind of one of those doubters also, right? And he, he showed me something. He showed me something. So I, I'm going to ease off of that. Um, <clears throat> I still think he needs to make better decisions. Yes. Uh, there was some throws where I just kind of like, yeah, you can't do that in the NFL. You know, you can get yeah, away definitely. with that in college, but you can't do that in the NFL. But he's going to learn. It's week one, man. He's going to learn. So uh, I think the Colts have a lot – to work with, uh, especially if they can get Jonathan Taylor back. I don't know how that's going to play out, but their defense, uh, you know, it, it's a stout D, and uh, they got some pieces as well. So I thought that was a really good division game, a really nice test week one for both teams. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really fun, like you said, to, to see Anthony Richardson step in and, and show improvements from college into the NFL. But jumping over, I mean, you mentioned it earlier. I was I was paying attention because, like I said, I want this to be a, a bounce back year for Baker. I don't know if that's going to be the case. It's still too early to tell. He started off slow, uh, and it was really not all on him. I think the entire game, he's. I feel like the the Buccaneers didn't look confident in themselves. Baker didn't look confident until really the second half kicked in, and they really turned it turned around. Uh, they were able to, they were able to do. I mean, their their defense really stepped up in big moments too. Even though they let Kirk Cousins throw for three hundred forty four yards uh, you know just they, they were able to cover Justin Jefferson for the most part uh, you know they, they'd never let him into the end zone and so that's that's what I can give them them props for and they only allowed 17 points against a pretty good offense there in, in Minnesota so seeing what the Buccaneers were able to do on defense I think that's what stood out the most but like you said Blake I think him winning over the locker room with that that you know uh, what was it a third and third and long or a fourth and long something like that third I think it was a third down where he was able to lower the pads uh, and, and force his way past that first down marker by a good margin even even though that he, he got hit pretty good he was going to make sure he gained that first down uh, and I think that really set the tone for the rest of the game because after that it just looked like it was a totally different team out there on the field it seemed like it quiet uh, quieted down that entire stadium um but but jeremy i mean uh, it it was good to see bake come out and and do something absolutely and everybody knows obviously for baker mayfield this is his make or break year you want to see baker mayfield shine and starting out week one like you mentioned it it seemed like he was a little sluggish but once he finally got the gears rolling he was baker was doing baker things but he was making a little bit of a smart decision than a couple of things they did at Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Baker Mayfield, like you said, threw 21 for 34 with 173 yards. Then that's really good for Baker's beginning with a new team. 
And looking at Kirk Cousins, we can all talk about Kirk, like Kirk Cousins for so much, but they're 33, 33 for 44 at 344 yards. That's a good that's a good day for Kirk Cousins. Um, my thing is if Kirk Cousins, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a good throw, don't do it when you're double covered like the one <laughs> where they ran it back from the reception. Then what's his name getting blown up? That has been on social media, just been lingering around now is pretty funny in my opinion but yeah I and, mean, and uh, yeah i mean overall uh blake i mean i, th- I think uh you know kirk cousins he, he played really well i think he, he i think every year he kind of shows that he's better than people want to want to give him credit for yeah um but you know o- overall I, I, he's one of those guys that i think can surprise you with it with his stats but uh, ultimately, I think uh, you, you kind of alluded to it earlier that that Buccaneer defense is really what ended up winning this game for him. Absolutely. This Buccaneers defense is filthy. Uh, DBs right here, Auburn University, baby. Uh, elite talent in that secondary. Um, defensive front stacked. Uh, Baker Mayfield, shout out to you, big dog. I doubted you, uh, but it, it was nice to see you come back lower the pads, pick up a first down when your team needed it, make plays down the stretch, uh, talking a little crap on the sidelines, love to see it, um, and got a big-time dub on the road, man, week one. So I'm excited about this Bucks team. My boy Dustin, he's a big Bucks fan, uh, you know, happy for them. And, uh, man, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That just – just I, I, don't, I don't know if Kirk Cousins is the guy, man. Not <laughs> really? No, I I think he's I think he's the guy for what they need there. Uh, I don't I don't really know what else what else you can get. I think the fact that they don't have a running back uh, like Dalvin Cook anymore, I think, is what really kind of hurts them. Yeah. So I you know, just looking at that, and then I think also right now without without some of your I, I think uh, uh, Addison, I think he played really well. Uh, he 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 stepped up and he came out because I was thinking they they lost uh, Thielen, you know, and, and losing a key receiver like that, a veteran receiver, that was one thing. I think they played pretty well overall. It was just this this defense kept them out of the end zone, and they were able to to get a key takeaway whenever they needed it the most. And uh, overall, I mean, the, the defense held them to I think it was forty some rushing yards. Uh, they, so that the Buccaneers held the Vikings to forty some rushing yards. Forty one yards. And yeah, just a really, really good show up by the defense there. And for the Buccaneers, I think they need to get the ground game rolling a little more too, because I think they had seventy three rushing yards, something like that too. So just overall I, I, I was I was pretty uh, really proud of Baker seeing what he was able to do. Uh, and I do want to call you out real, real quick, Blake. You didn't just you didn't just uh, not believe in him. You called him trash. So uh, and let, let's let's not remember how far you went with that one. That kind of hurt me in my soul yeah. just a little bit. But I still think he is trash. But uh, <laughs> we'll see. I am I am proud of him. I yeah, we'll him. see. He's he's got some time to to prove prove the haters wrong. But like you said too, some of the chippiness on the sideline. That's kind of what we what you need from Baker too. But uh, I, I'm I'm keeping up with this Jets Bills game right now. It's going on live for us right now. So you you guys. Are probably already going to know the outcome, but right now it's tied three to three. It looks like the Jets just kicked a field goal to tie it. Um, Blake, I saw you you sent over a little message saying that uh, Aaron Rodgers hurt ankle. Uh, was it confirmed that it was broken? Uh, some people on Twitter and everything are saying uh, it looks like an Achilles now. Really, he's got a boot. On it. Yeah, he's got a boot on it right now. So, um, yeah, doesn't look good. Well, that's that's fantastic because our fantasy league we have Aaron Rodgers as our quarterback, uh, and that's not good. So, pretty much, pretty much that that this whole week was just kind of seemed like, uh, man, just a disaster on our on our fantasy team. But we're going against uh, the the high low sports guys over there, Kelsey and DJ, and yeah, our our team just kind of imploded in in, in big spots. Uh, you know, I was I was we. we we had a good shot too without Kelsey in the game um, because Travis Kelsey was out. I, I felt like, man, we have a really good shot of winning this thing. And then it just seemed like some key key pieces weren't able to go in. I also made it meant to make some roster changes or uh, depth chart changes that I, I forgot to throw in too that could have helped us a little bit, but ultimately just just not winning this week. It's going to be zero and one start to the season, but right. we're going to be able to move on. We're we're still not to halftime yet, guys. Uh, it's tied three to three. You look at Josh Allen right now. He's only thrown 58 yards, I'm seeing, and one interception on on the game so far. Brees Hall must have had a huge run somewhere in there because he's got two carries for 109 yards. 
uh, I, I I meant to throw that up on the TV too, so we could see that while it's going on. But I'm, I mean, what are, what are we seeing in this game? Do we do we think that that Jets defense is nasty enough to still come out and win this game, or do you think the Bills now without Aaron Rodgers in the game for the Packers, maybe the Bills are going to be able to start to pull ahead uh, and make something of this? Uh, I, I guess I'll start off with you, Jeremy. I think I'll, I think the Bills are going to try and take it and run with it. However, New York's defense is is pretty is pretty dominant so i it, it's kind of hard for me to pick a little bit just because you look at like you said both sides of the ball you want to see buffalo take this kind of a thing and capitalize with it but however you want to see um you want to see the jets stand up for their quarterback who just obviously got hurt and has a boot on then they want to they want to pull this out for him and they want to make him feel good that but i think the bills are just gonna run away with it in my opinion yeah, I'm seeing the replay just now, right now, too, of, of that of that injury. injury. It doesn't look good, but it doesn't look like it Horrible. could be quite an Achilles. I don't know. I mean, he, he definitely twists it a little bit or gets rolled on, but it, it didn't look too bad. To me? Uh, and so, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm hopeful for Aaron Rodgers. I, this is, I really want to see him go out on, on a good note, you know, and see this. I mean, that, that sucks. But, Blake, do you think that defense is good enough where they're going to still be able to win this game for the Jets? Yeah, um, Josh Allen almost just threw another pick. Um, oh boy! This, yeah, this Jets defense is nasty. Um, I don't know, man. Like Zach Wilson's in the game now. I don't know if the Jets can move the ball uh, on offense. Uh, you're going to have to rely on Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook. Um, it's just really, in my opinion, it's going to be a field uh, a field possession game. Yeah. Uh, like who who who's going to get the best field position? You know, are, the Bills are moving the ball right now. Uh, can they get points right here before the half? Uh, can the Jets get a turnover or two uh, in this in this second quarter or going into the second half? Uh, I, I don't think Zach Wilson is going to drive the length of the field on this Bills defense. So uh, I would take the Bills to finish this one out. Uh, but Josh Allen's got to play better, man. Yeah, 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 definitely. I would have expected him to have played a lot better than than what I'm seeing so far. But uh, guys, let's jump over to the two minute drill. Uh, Jeremy, you got that that pulled up for you? Yes, I do. Okay, let's go to the two minute drill. But before we do it, this two minute drill is brought to you by Mahler Bros. You can check out Mahler Bros. Golf. Uh, polos and t-shirts and mugs and all kinds of great things over at MahlerBros.com. MahlerBros is the best place to get all of your t-shirts, polos, golf apparel, uh, your your coffee even to wake you up and get you ready to hit the golf course. And even if it's not golf season, you can still get yourself a nice bogey blend, an ace blend. We're going to have a lot more. I keep on saying that. There's a lot more that's going to be coming to the shop. I just had to sell out of some of the stuff that we had uh, currently. And so we had to kind of kind of lower some of the, the inventory before we can jump forward but we're getting really close uh, i think i'm going to try to pro- probably work on that maybe this week and next week make sure we get some more a lot of amazing flavors that i'm really excited to try out uh, and so uh, go over mahlerbros.com if you want to check out the coffee that's mahlerbros.com slash coffee or you can just go to mahlerbros.com m-a-h-l-e-r-b-r-o-s.com and for listening to the show we're going to give you guys an exclusive deal for 15 percent off just use code rising2 that's r-i-s-i-n-g-t-o for 15 percent off a, a lot of great things coming over there at mala bros so go over there support mala bros and you can help us get more added on there too we've got a lot a lot of new uh drops that we want to get dropped on there but we just kind of need a little bit more support before we can move past that we've got we've got a certain a certain uh, mark that we're trying to make before getting there uh, and once we reach that mark, we've got a lot of big things coming to the store. So go check us out, mahlerbros.com. That's M-A-H-L-E-R-B-R-O-S.com and use code RISING2 for 15% off. But guys, let's get to the two-minute drill, Jeremy. Two-minute drill, kicking off the first one. The overreaction from Oklahoma staff about Art Bryles on the field. Now, now Oklahoma offensive coordinator Jeff Lebby apologizes Monday after his father-in-law disgraced former Baylor coach Art Bryles and he was seen on the field with Levy after Oklahoma's 28-11 win over SMU on Saturday night. And I know um, he was let go in 2016 after an investigation concluded after his staff took no action against the players named in the sexual assault allegations. Now, Josh, take me through all of this just for people that obviously haven't really heard much about this. Yeah, so... 
you know, being an Oklahoma fan, I'm getting a lot of the Oklahoma news pretty much right as it happens. And one of the first things I see after the game, rather than you know the press conference, uh, inter- you know, interviews and stuff like that, they, they are I guess the post game interviews, all that kind of stuff. I'm seeing news about Art Bryles was on the field. Oh my goodness! And Brent Venables responded to it, and Joe Castiglione uh, responds to it. The the AD. And they're 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 worrying about Art Briles being on the field. Now let's get this straight and understand the situation. Art Briles was on the field because his son-in-law is Jeff Levy, who is the offensive coordinator for for uh, Oklahoma. So seeing what happened there, it was it was because he's he's down on the field after the game. It's not like he was down there helping the coaching staff or anything like that. Uh, for those who don't know, Art Briles was a Baylor coach, uh, like Jeremy said, who was who is fired because of some sexual uh, sexual assault allegations that he didn't take care of as a head coach. And rightfully so. He should have been he should have been removed, but he's he's not uh, and I don't know if we're going to get flagged for me saying this, but I don't really care. He's not a pedophile. He's not he's not the, the man who 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 uh, acted upon the you know he wasn't the one creating these these sexual assaults himself and so it just it, it it seems blown out of proportion to me and then now uh they're saying that they're 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 taking t- taking care of it and they're they're making sure that this will never happen again as if it was some kind of a attack on the field the dude was down there con- congratulating his son-in-law and was there with his family uh, i think this is something that we we need to stop blowing out of proportion absolutely blake what do you got to take about all of this Man, uh, I mean, what do you, you know, uh, I don't know, man. It's just kind of weird that, like, uh, how awkward they made Brett Venables feel about it in the post game presser. Yeah. Like, that's what kind of got me is I was looking at that and, and he was just like, look, we'll address it, you know. Uh, it is what it is. It happened. Sorry. Like it just felt like uh, it felt like he was really awkward about it. It was an awkward mood, uh, and I don't know. I, I guess you're just gonna have to keep him off the field the rest of the season. I, I just I don't know, man. That thing in Baylor kind of it it stayed with him. It carried with him, and and uh, I don't know. He he took a lot of heat over that, and. It's just a bad situation all around. Uh, people people make mistakes, but they do get better, right? Uh, dude deserves a second chance, in my opinion. Uh, it, it was it was an awful thing that happened at Baylor, but hopefully he's grown as a person, and you know, maybe maybe he's he's got his act together. So. You know, I don't. I didn't really see it being a big deal that he was no, on the field. No. That's that's kind of where I'm at. Like, why why are we making this so such a big, big problem? I mean, the, the dude was down there with his son-in-law. Exactly. Can he can he not go stand with his daughter and his grandchildren and and his yeah. son-in-law and, and congratulate him on a win? To me, it to me it got way way blown out of proportion. Yeah, but, definitely. But moving on to the next topic, Mel Tucker suspended without pay for sexual assault allegations. Then Michigan State University announced Sunday that. It, they have suspended head football coach Mel Tucker without pay. Then later in the day, USA Today reported he has been under investigation about alleged sexual harassment. Vice President, Director of Athletics Alan Hoster, Alan Hostler, excuse me, said at a news conference, Tucker is the subject of an ongoing investigation that began in December. An investigative report was submitted in July, and a formal hearing will take place the week of October 5th. Now, Blake, obviously I know this is – Michigan State is already on the hot seat for right now, but then adding salt to the wound and having Mel Tucker having this going on, what do you think is – what do you think is going to happen to Michigan State just overall with, with this and their entire situation? Well, I know Mel come out and said that she's uh, she's the manager of Capelbees. So, um, you know, we're just going to have to see it play out. Uh, see what it was all about apparently they started having a uh, a little relationship on the side and uh you know i'm gonna wait for all the details to come out on this one uh you know there was a leak report yesterday saying he got fired that wasn't the case yeah yeah um i don't know man it just seems like mill has ran that program into the ground (laughs) Um, he got that contract and things have just went south so 
you know, maybe it is best to just go ahead and get rid of him. I don't know. I don't think they really want to get rid of him right now, though, because of the buyout and all the money they just gave him. So, yeah. you know, um, yeah, I'm just going to wait and see what comes out of this before I make any statements on it, because apparently Mel's saying that she is just making all of this up, uh, that, you know, I don't know. It, it's a whirlwind. I, it's It's too much for me. Absolutely. Then, Josh, there there were some some things that were in the report that kind of show that there was a lot more to it. That was like, yeah, that's that's definitely creepy, but it does kind of smell a little fishy to me. I mean, it's innocent until proven guilty is ultimately where we're always going to stand. We're never going to say that one one side is wrong or, or right. Uh, it just from the outside looking in and, and hearing the reports, it seems a little weird just because. Uh, I believe uh, I could be wrong, but I believe that if he's fired for these allegations, they don't have to give him that buyout. Uh, that's so, true. so that's that's the thing that just makes it kind of weird to me is like, okay, this is coming out from back in 2021, I believe, and it was the sexual harassment lady. Uh, she came in there to to talk to to the the school about sexual harassment. She was an honorary captain for one of the games while she was there at the spring game uh, and stuff. And so you know, and from the from the sound of it. You know, her and her and Mel obviously had phone calls and stuff. And then all of a sudden, when when was the point where she said, I don't want to be a part of this? I mean, that's that's the part that's just in question for me. But I'm I'm right there with you, Blake. It just it just sounds weird to me. Um, But I think Michigan State's going about this the right way, because what we saw uh, up in Buffalo, whenever their punter, uh, uh, Matt Ariza, had had some of these similar things coming out about him they just fired him right right there on the spot didn't didn't want to look into it or anything they're still paying him they're still looking into it uh they're just not letting him be around the program i think this is a perfect situation that's the perfect way to handle it uh and and ultimately that's where i stand but yeah just hopefully it's not true uh for just the pure fact that i don't think he's going to be able to get a head coaching job if it is but um yeah i mean i mean i just I, i think Maybe for Michigan State, maybe they hope it is true. I don't know. Yeah. But they, they started off on a good note this year, so yeah. who, who knows what they're able to do for the rest of the season. You can, only, season. You can only do so much, like you said, Josh, proven and find until proven guilty, but we're going to stick to that. But moving on to the next topic, Kevin <laughs> Porter Jr. arrested on felony domestic violence charges after allegedly assaulting his girlfriend. Then Houston Rockets guard Kevin Porter Jr. was arrested and charged with assault and strangulation after incident at a New York hotel Monday morning. Police responded to a 911 call reporting of assault at 6.45 a.m. and arrested Porter. After investigation, both charges are felonies. Of course, upon arrival, officers were informed that a 26-year-old female sustained a laceration to the right side of her face and was complaining about pain to her neck. A A preliminary investigation on scene determined that a known individual structure multiple times upon her face and body placed his hands around her neck. Now, I know speaking for all three of us, there is one thing you should never do, and that is never put your hands on a woman. Yeah. That is one thing. If you ask any of us, we will give you more than just a lecture about it. But, Blake, I know Kevin Porter Jr. has had his name out there in the, in the reins, but... Now having this come up, what do you think is the outcome for Kevin Porter Jr.? Uh, get him out of the league. I, that's that's all I, I really got to say. It just kind of seems like the evidence is there, man. Uh, get him out. I, I just – no place for it. Uh, like we always say, man, put yourself in better situations. Um No place for it, man. No place for it. Uh, It's just, yeah. I, I just that that's crazy to me, man. It it really is. It's just, uh, it's immaturity. It's immaturity for real. And uh, I guess you think that you're in the spotlight, and you know you're in the NBA, and you can get away with things like that. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but uh, uncalled for. And I think you know, get him out of the league. Absolutely, Josh. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's it's gross. Uh, it's it's just why? I mean, you, you know you know how much more powerful you are. This isn't like the Mel Tucker situation or Matariza and allegations that can't be proven. It, from the sounds of it, it sounds like he messed her up pretty good. Uh, I mean, it, you know, and it, this wasn't just like, hey, we were yelling at each other, so I'm going to report him because I can get money out of him. It sounded like she, you know he did some damage. Uh, so, dude, uh, yeah, I mean, just 
you, you've got to you've got to be better than that. You've you've got to be a better man than that. Uh, not only that, but you're in such a big place, uh, you know, in, in, in such a great place in your life, having the talent that you have and in, in the position you're in to be a professional athlete that a lot of us would, would kill to have. Uh, and so just, you know, don't screw your life up over this kind of stuff. No. Um, but, yeah, just be, be a better man. That's all we got. Absolutely. And then going on to the last topic, UFC 293, Anastasia goes – down versus Strickland. Then UFC 293, like I said, Sean Strickland dethrones Israel Anastasia in a huge upset and wins this middleweight title. Is this his first time winning the title? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I mean, Adesanya has been the dude yeah, he's been for the, so long. You know that He's been the go of the middleweights. Yeah. But sticking to it, he won 49-46 to 46 on all three judge scorecards, closed as a plus 500 underdog rate. To me, that's... That's mind-boggling. Then I know Strickland under the fight with entered the fight, but the best strike defense among active middleweights at 62.4 percent. Unofficially, Strickland offended 65 percent of Anastasia's strikes throughout the five rounds to cause him to land just 24 of 178 head strikes. Now, Josh, I I don't I assume you probably had the opportunity to watch this fight. Give yeah, I was able give, to go back. Yeah, yeah. Give, Give everybody a little bit of your perspective of what you saw in the fight and how everything went down. Yeah, I was bummed because I couldn't watch it live. We went up, uh, you know, saw saw some of our friends that are really good musicians. Uh, shout out to Jed Hoos. We went up to Mitchell, South Dakota, go see them as we were out late. Uh, didn't get to watch this fight, but man, I was able to go back and watch it. And Strickland surprised me. I I, I knew he had a chance, but Adesanya is just such a monster. Uh, the fact that he landed fifty two percent compared to Adesanya's thirty four. That defense, like you said, he stood up big time. Yeah. He was able to get him on the ground uh, on the ground five different times and just controlled the fight the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, I mean, just looking at this dude, he was he he deserves that man. I mean, he, there was there was never a doubt that Strickland was gonna win this. There was never a doubt that he 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 had the win. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, Adesanya, hats off to you for holding it for for as long as you have. You've been a dude uh, in the in the. Uh, UFC right now, but uh, it's just Strickland. Strickland had your number, dude. Uh, I mean, this this guy, Sean Sean Strickland. Shout out to you, man. You, you deserve that that belt right now. Uh, and overall, it was a, it was a pretty cool card. I, I liked the entirety of the the you know the, the prelims and everything. Uh, from what I saw, I didn't I didn't see the early prelims and I didn't see all of the prelims. But uh, I was able to catch catch most of the the main card and seeing this main fight. Watch the whole thing there. Uh, really really good fight as a whole um but yeah and just again hats off to you sean for yeah. for getting out there with the title congratulations man now blake obviously i know for some of the people who aren't that big into the middleweights talking about anasanya having such a big reputation then having strickland come with the octagon then pulling off the unbelievable upset take us through what you think it would do to try and be in his shoes and pull off the biggest upset of his career uh, look, first thing I want to say is uh, thank you, Sean Strickland. I appreciate it. <laughs> Israel Adesanya is the most cringiest human being to walk the face of this earth. Uh, I, I just have never been a huge fan. He's a great fighter, but some of the stuff that he does is just like super cringe to me. I uh, agree. Yeah, it's like, like, bro, we're not in a real life anime. He's just uh, weird. He's yeah, he's different. It's, it's super weird. Um, but Sean put the pressure on him, man. And uh, one thing that I've always saw in Adesanya when he fights is he never he never backpedals. All right, he he never dances around the ring. He always puts the pressure and walks the fighter down uh, in his fights. And Saturday night was the complete opposite. He looked slow. He looked defeated out the gate. He got rocked in round one. Uh, Sean, I mean, look. One thing I'll give Izzy is he bounced back after that because I thought he was dead. All yeah. Right? Um, I'll give him his due there. He got up. Chin, A-OK. -okay. I'll give him that. But Sean put the pressure on him, man. Sean uh, constantly switching stances, throwing different things at him. Uh, you know, I, th I thought he was A-plus the other night, and that's what he had to do, right? And uh, He just never really let Izzy – fill him out and, and get a real distance on him. Uh, and Sean just kept attacking, man. So, uh, you know, good for him. I'm glad to see that he is the uh, the new champ because I've just never been an Izzy fan, man. Too much cringe for me. Yeah. Absolutely. But that wraps it up for two-minute drill. Josh, 
back to you. Yeah, that pretty much wraps up everything that we've got for the episode tonight, guys. We, we had a lot of fun. It was good to be able to get back in here with all three of us again and give you guys some mm-hmm. content. Uh, we, by the way, too, I do want to throw out, too, that... Uh, you know, if, if you guys are looking for a little bit of betting advice, I think I I think I found something we're going to try to do each week, uh, and maybe maybe at least on our Thursday episode. So if you're if you're watching right now, first of all, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, I don't know. Four point nine seven. Still, still at four point nine, man. We're we're right there. We we we're need so that close. we need that last push. So if you are subscribed. Do us an extra favor and just give us a little share on social media or uh, maybe send it to a couple of your friends or something like that or that are also sports fans, whatever the case is, because, man, we're right there at 5,000. We've been there for a while. We were hoping to get that a couple weeks ago. You know, we had a rapid growth right before college football season. We were hoping it would be able to push over. So give us give us a subscribe real quick. And uh, if you are subscribed, like I said, uh, just hit that, that uh, share button and share us with maybe friends or social media, whatever the case may be. But guys, we thank you so much for watching, for all the support. Uh, oh yeah, and I, I guess I did. I didn't get to. I didn't get to finish what I was saying. But on Thursday's episodes, if you're watching right now, uh, you know we, we release on Tuesdays at 8:30 uh, as a premiere, and then again on Thursdays, we're gonna try to throw in some some of our favorite bets for the weekend. We're gonna give you maybe three from each of us for our favorite bets for the weekend uh, coming up for college football season. So we're gonna do this all college football season long. If you listened to me last Thursday, because these two weren't able to uh, link up with me, I think it was kind of my scheduling issue for the most part jeremy was out of town on vacation uh and so i was able to, to put one out by myself if you listen to me could have made some good money i made some good money over the weekend uh just taking those bets and so uh just tune in uh maybe we'll give you guys a little bit more advice and of course you can go to rising2.com slash bet to find sports books in your area or you can always place those bets on bro throw as well that's another sponsor of ours that we love using but guys again thank you so much for watching for all of the support uh, if you're listening on apple podcast you can give us a five-star review that is the best way to help us over on that platform whether it's apple podcast spotify wherever you listen to podcasts but guys you can always hit that notification bell so that you know when we're going live. We're going to be live on Saturday morning. Uh, hopefully this Saturday morning, I don't forget a power cord and screw up the whole show. I'll but call you and make sure you don't <laughs> we're going to we're going to make sure that we get a checklist going. We might even have to buy duplicates of some of the, the equipment that we bring along with us. We don't got to tear it down and put it back up and everything. But uh, guys, thanks again for all of the support. And until next time.